uh, MP4 file. There you okay. Go. All right. So uh, recording is thank in you. progress. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. And uh, Greg is from the uh, Phoenix, Arizona office of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Ecological Services Office. And uh, there's a brief bio about Greg. Uh, he went to uh, UC Davis and graduated from there with a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology. And he was very important in establishing the Bald Eagle Program in Arizona. And since then, he has worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service with responsibility for the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher. Sounds like a, a heavy responsibility. <laughs> At any rate, um, let's go ahead with Greg and find out about the flycatcher and tamarisk. And this is really going to be interesting because I hadn't heard some of this before. I sneaked a little look at his slide deck. Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, thank you um, very much for that. And thanks for inviting me. And thanks for everybody for attending. I appreciate it. Um, um, you're, uh, you're right. I spent about a decade at Game and Fish. Uh, I spent the last 25 years at Fish and Wildlife, and I am approximately four months and 15 days away from retirement. <laughs> yeah, Good for you. Exactly. Um, so this might be the last presentation I give on Tamrisk, and I'm thankful for that. It's it's a it's a subject that is controversial. It's a subject that I never thought I would spend such a large part of my career on, um, and it's a subject that get that can get a lot of people really worked up. Um, but um, so the the first part of this presentation, I'm gonna. Um, talk a little bit about the flycatcher and its status, and, and then um, we'll move on to the flycatcher and tamarisk, and then a little bit about some of the misconceptions about tamarisk and and uh, the tamarisk leaf beetle. And that, I can, I could talk about this stuff for hours, so it's trying to keep this within an hour is gonna be tough, but I'll try my best. Um, and uh, if, if this is review for some of you folks, if you're all up to date on this, forgive me, just be patient. And if I'm, I'm prone to some dumb jokes now and then, so uh, be patient with that too, okay? Um, so let me um, uh, share my screen. Hopefully I can get this to work here, folks, okay? Yeah, we see Looks it. Good. All right. That work? Yeah. yeah. All Perfect. right. Yeah, you're in presentation mode now. Excellent. You can hear me too? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh a nice title page, nice little picture of the flycatcher. Um Impidnax trailii extremist. Okay. The uh, southwestern willow flycatchers, it's a subspecies of the willow flycatcher. Um, it breeds in uh, southwestern U.S. It it really is a riparian obligate. It really does not nest anywhere outside of the riparian area unless somebody has manipulated something right nearby to create a lot of riparian habitat. It's not going to be in an ag field or in your backyard or... Uh, um, uplands, uh, it really stays along the river. Um, it's a neotropical migrant, which means it only spends a few months here and then takes, you know, takes it down to Central and uh, Northern South America. Um, other willow flycatcher species, there's, there's a handful of them. I'll, I'll mention it and I'll show a picture in, in a moment. Um, they, they, they all migrate through Arizona in the Southwest which means when all of them are migrating, uh, they can all occur at the same time. 
and that can make identifying these birds, which are not particularly easy to identify in the first place, you can tell they're pretty nondescript um, and they can get confused with other birds. They don't have the kind of markings like a vermilion flycatcher or a bald eagle or uh, 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 all the various ducks that makes it easily, easily identifiable by sight. And so it's really identified by its the timing of its occurrence and its call. And, um, you know, if you're all birders, you know, everybody, all the birders try and use some collection of sounds to, to uh, express its call. And for the flycatcher, what's common is a sneezy fits bew. Okay. <laughs> so here's a, a map of the distribution of the various subspecies. Uh, so we've got, you know, uh, Extimus in Arizona, New Mexico, Southern Utah, Colorado, Nevada, and parts of Southern California. And then we've got Brewster Eye on the coast, Adastus, and then uh, Tralei Tralei uh, across uh, you know the eastern part of the, northeastern part of the United States and central part of the U.S. And like I mentioned, they don't spend a lot of time here. Um, they're here for about three to four months. Um, they're down in the wintering grounds for a similar amount of time, and the other um, <clears throat> portion of the year, excuse me, um, they're flying north and flying south. Um, we uh, uh, just got a hit, actually. There are these things called MOTUS, M-O-T-U-S stations. They're kind of like cell towers for um, for migrating birds. You can put a little a little tag on a bird. It's, it's kind of like radio telemetry, but much smaller. It's called a nano tag. And we just uh, experimented the first time by putting them on flycatchers um, this past, uh, this, this breeding season. And some birds were um, attached with these nano tags up near um, Wikiup on the Big Sandy River along Highway 93, if you're familiar with that area. And um, the folks doing the study saw those birds on like the 25th of, of July. And the end of last week, those uh, two of those birds there were found in on in Sinaloa on by a motor station. So Sinaloa is kind of um, north of Mazatlan. So if you kind of went just due uh, east from Cabo San Lucas and hit the mainland, that's kind of where uh, those birds were found. So in about two weeks or so, they were able to go from Wiki up down to Sinaloa. Pretty cool, huh? Wow. Yeah. Um. So we listed the flycatcher as endangered in 1995. So it's been been almost 30 years. Um, and the reasons for its, its uh, uh, listing was habitat, habitat reduction primarily and alteration. When we proposed it for listing, um, I was a little, actually a little surprised at this. I, um, I hadn't read this before. We we knew of 111 territories at the proposal, but when we when we listed it, I want to say that we knew of about 300 or so. So there must have been some new information that came in in the subsequent years from when we proposed it to when we listed it. And that's not unusual, you know. What as soon as we list something, suddenly everybody goes out and looking looking for it, and you know information starts to come in. Um, so we we finished the recovery plan in, in 2002. Um, we designated critical habitat in 2013. And um, well, actually we redesignated it. Critical habitat has been a, a long and bumpy road. And if you're into, into regulations, you, you probably all know that critical habitat is something that we constantly get sued over and we've we've gone through at least three critical habitat designations and thankfully we haven't had to do it since 2013 and i hope it sticks and we don't have to do it anymore 
And what was great uh, when we when we were able to redesignate is we were able to follow the strategy and the recovery plan because um, critical habitat really is a tool for conservation, which means recovery. So, um, so if you looked if you looked at the proposed critical habitat, we actually you know it's, this is coming to come into play in the next future slide where I show you the re the recovery. Um, regions and the uh, management units, but we were able to put a, a segment of critical habitat in all the areas that we um, needed to have territories in order to reach recovery. And that sounds like, well, you we should do that all the time for all the critters, but it doesn't always happen. So, so this this is good compared to Tim the the picture that you're in front of as far as showing what breeding habitat looks like. Um, flycatcher breeding habitat occurs on flat, broad floodplains, mostly along major rivers, from about eight thousand feet down to sea level. Sometimes we get some creeks and exposed lake bottoms, but it's the portions of these streams that can uh, support dense, broad forests of riparian habitat. So these are, you know, often valleys, um, the, 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 the bottom portion of streams. Um, you don't get, you don't, flycatcher habitat isn't in canyons. A lot of times the headwaters of streams don't have flycatcher habitat. It's where all that water collects um, and, and the water spreads out and the water seeps into the groundwater, surface water, and you have that ability to grow um, lots of vegetation. And typically, you know, we kind of say about three trees wide, give or take. Um, flycatcher habitat isn't, isn't just overstory. It's really a com it's really a, a, a mid serial stage nesting species where you have a lot of vegetation from you know 20 feet down to the ground. They don't nest in the canopies of cottonwoods or if in matured willows, they're in the trees that are 20 feet tall. Okay. Their nests are, you know, usually six to 20 feet up in the air and in some places, odd oddball spots. We've even found nests and things like button bush or stinging nettle, like three feet above the ground. Um, but you can see in these pictures, you can see uh, um, this, uh, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor here? Yes. yes. Yeah, you can, you can see this understory of tamarisk and this overstory of willow. And here that again, this understory here and this overstory there. You can see how broad this this chunk of habitat. This is at Roosevelt Lake. I mean, it, lo it looks like a golf course. I know it's like there's a sand trap there, but this is Salt River as it enters into Roosevelt Lake, and as that water receded, all this this is all tamarisk um, um, developed, and this is the entrance to a Horseshoe Lake uh, on the Verde River, and you can see how wet that is and. And the, the width of habitat here is a few trees wide. Um, and so this is a stuff that flycatchers really like, um, you know, in central Arizona. And these these areas are are, are, are moist, you know, they're they're wet. Um, if you're on some some place like the San Pedro River, you might actually lose surface water during the breeding season. But if you, you know, if you kick down into the dirt a little bit, that soil is still going to be moist, okay? It's because of that elevated groundwater that supports that abundant riparian habitat. In some place like the San Pedro, you know, towards the middle or end of the breeding season, you might get some monsoonal flow that'll help bring back a little surface water. Um, and the actual trees that flycatchers put their nests in, 
you know, it's 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 an actual it's an it's an accurately named bird. It's it's often willow. It's Gooding willow, Gooding's willow, and coyote willow. Um, the the few places where we have flycatchers nesting um, up in the mountains. Um, trying to remember the variety of species up there. It's different than Gooding's and coyote willow, but th those are those shrubby willow species that you'll find, like on the. Little Colorado and the San Francisco River, kind of near Greer, if, you, if you're familiar with that area. Um, usually their territories are not always, I should say, sometimes their territories are not uniformly dense habitat. So you, you can see this stuff here at Roseville. I mean, it's just a wall of habitat. Um, but if you actually had a better look at this area, a better look at this area, these areas are actually mosaics of habitat where there's some open spaces and some dense spaces and some um, semi-dense spots. So its habitat doesn't have to be a universal wall of habitat like it looks in this picture here. But the nests are usually placed in the denser portion of, of a territory. Oh, and we can get, you know, we can get habitat that's, uh, that's all exotic. We can get habitat that's all native and we can have habitat that's mixtures of, of exotic and native that fly catchers will use. Kind of the whole, the whole, um, the whole uh, variety. So this is a this is a picture from the or a, uh, a map from the recovery plan, and um, this is kind of about this is this is trying to show you kind of how we've designed recovery, and you can see that we've got these thick purple lines here, and these help delineate these larger recovery units. Well, you know, we have a Rio Grande recovery unit, a Gila recovery unit, coastal California, et cetera. And then these, these lighter kind of pinkish lines that you see around here, those, those make up management units. And I, you know, we've got, I think about 30 management units across the range. And they're, you know, it's like, it's like the range is carved up into puzzle pieces. In each puzzle piece, there's a numerical goal that ranges between 25 and 325, okay, for a total of 1,950 territories. And I should I should clarify it. A territory represents a single breeding pair of flycatchers, usually a male and a female, okay. Um, so we've got these 30 management units across the range. You know, they're usually kind of geared towards drainages. So we'll have a Verde management unit, a Gila San Pedro management unit, an upper Gila management unit, a lower Rio Grande, middle Rio Grande, upper Rio Grande. Um, we'll have, you know, uh, uh, Parker to international border on the Colorado River, Hoover to Parker, um, all these areas. And we like said we've had, we have numerical goals, territory goals for each of these puzzle pieces across the range that range from 25 to 325 for a total of 1,950. Um, it's, it's important for the flycatcher for these populations to occur throughout the range and to be in proximity. That, that helps the stability and the connectivity is important. Um, Flycatchers actually have a lot of fidelity to, to a general nest area. You know, it's not like a bald eagle that'll come back to the same tree in the same nest everything, every single year, um, but they will return to within about 30 kilometers of where they nested the previous year. And every once in a while, you know, some birds will make long distances, but they have a lot of fidelity and, and populations will build as, as, as they continue, as they, as they grow in an area, then they will start to uh, reach out 
and disperse and colonize a new area and so forth so that we have you know a cookie cookie crumb sort of trail of fly catchers across the range that's that's the goal that's why the recovery goals are established this way unfortunately what we have today is that we have a lot of fly catchers in a in a few spots and not as many across the range so you know the good news is as i mentioned that when the bird was listed um, you know, we had probably a few hundred territories. Now, the last range-wide estimate that we had was, was just over 1,600 territories. So that's great. Um, a lot of that is based upon surveys, more surveys, but some of that is also based upon growth. And the, the five spots where we have the most flycatchers is the Roosevelt Lake area where um, Tonneau Creek and the Salt River uh, um, join, the uh, Gila, uh, the Gila San Pedro confluence area, um, the upper Gila area, uh, kind of the from above San Carlos Lake through the Safford Valley, um, further up the Gila River in uh, western New Mexico in the Cliff Gila Valley and the um, uh, Middle Rio Grande near Elephant Butte. These five areas have over half of all the known flycatcher territories. And it's not a surprise based upon what I mentioned about the fidelity of flycatchers that, that you see these, these handful of areas um, in relatively close proximity. Um, maybe another way to put it is, you, you always know the phrase from field to, field of dreams, if you build it, they'll come, right? Um, for flycatchers, uh, if you build it, it'll come if it's in close proximity to an area with a lot of flycatchers, <laughs> okay? Um, if, if we build flycatcher habitat, uh, a long distance from from known flycatchers, like down here, uh, it's going to be hard for them to find them, you know. Um, but that's 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 the goal um, is to have them in in high connectivity and populations across the range. These dots here rep represent they don't represent abundance; they just represent they just represent spots that have had a flycatcher territory in the past. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, we listed the flycatcher because of, um, you know, uh, mostly from loss of habitat or alteration of habitat. And, and really, when you look at the primary reason, it's water, it's water management, it's, it's damming, um, river regulation, channelization, diversion, groundwater pumping. Th those are the main reasons why the flycatcher uh, is, is listed. And then we have some kind of tertiary re reasons like overgrazing, um, fire, habitat removal, and we've added a new one since it was listed, the tamarisk leaf beetle. And things like fire, you know, this is a this is partially a product of of damming and river regulation and and diversion is that we're drying our river areas more. And then of course, as we occur, most of these fires that we that we see in the news and read about are usually caused by us. You know, we we are us as an ignition source. Um, so water um, water manipulation um, is really the primary reason why the flycatcher is listed. So let me stop right there um, and 
and see if you have any questions because I'm I'm going to move into the tamarisk portion here in a moment. Does does, does was, was any of that unclear? Did, was there anything um, I can help answer? All right. Well, actually, I I have a question. I was waiting to see if anyone else would ask, but um, do the flycatchers, the southwestern willow flycatcher? ever give their call on migration or strictly in, in yeah. breeding territory no they'll do it on migration too and and they'll protect they'll protect areas on their wintering grounds as well and and do their call so yeah exactly you you can um you know our survey protocol is uh a um a call playback um mm -hmm. protocol where you solicit a response from them by playing their call and in the in the early time of the season, when they're all migrating through, you can get um, uh, the other subspecies to respond. Um, and there's been some studies, though. You know, there's a, there there's always controversy with listed species, and we um, had uh, uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is also a in uh, working with the New Mexico Cattle Growers Association, they, um, which was also working with some other people, they petitioned us to delist the flycatcher um, because they said that it wasn't a subspecies. And um, we, we did a full evaluation. And um, I think that's some of the stuff I forage you carry. By the way, um, I, I should have mentioned, I, I forwarded Carrie, I don't know if you've seen it yet, about and a half dozen papers and a couple links with some literature that kind of supports some of the things that um, I'm talking about today, if you wanted to dig into these topics more. Yeah, um, I forwarded that in the um, meeting notice, I think. Good. Okay. Um, and I think I think I put our, our five-year review in that, which also included a response to this petition. And, and one of the things that scientists have looked at is the uniqueness of the call of the various subspecies of flycatcher. And they've found that there, there are notable difference in the southwestern willow flycatcher compared to the other ones and birds' responses to them. So for the, the people that are into sonograms and the nerding out and those sorts of aspects, um, um, there is some nuances between their their, their calls. Uh, one thing I would like to point out before you proceed is yeah. among the more conscientious birders, it's not considered uh, the right thing to do to play calls to try to get birds to respond. I and that that's and you know in. In our um, in our protocol, you know, in what we do, we actually require people to get a permit in order to, to do that, and so they do it in a in a way that's dictated by the protocol, so we don't disturb the birds too much and agitate them and take them away from the normal activities. Um, and it, and if you're if you're in a place where there's a lot of flycatchers or decent number amount they'll let you know that they're there regardless you know especially when there's when they're uh, establishing territories and defending territories and trying to solicit a female they're pretty darn vocal you know they're they're, they're not they, they get quiet when they when they when they're on eggs when they have babies but early in the season they're they're banging it out there they're they're not they're not shy question do they prefer flowing water in in uh in arizona or intermittent water what what kind of a water regime do they prefer um i don't think that water in and of itself is something that they clue into um i think it's the vegetation structure and the vegetation density um well, let me give you an so I, I I use this example actually when we do our um some of our our uh, field training, and we're usually on a spot in the lower San Pedro where you can you can step over the river 
it's it's that it's that small. You can you, know, you can spit over it, right? And and I'll say, look at look at the water here. It's I you know, the river is so teeny, but look at the amount of vegetation. You know, the floodplain is a quarter mile wide, and there's cottonwood trees all across this floodplain. Okay. The reason why these trees and this vegetation here is here is not the surface water. It's the elevated groundwater that's across this area. And contrast that to the Colorado River below Hoover Dam, let's say below Lake Mojave, where you've got a huge amount of water coming down there. And look at how much, look how little vegetation there is across that floodplain. Okay. Surface water is not indicative of the amount of vegetation. Okay. So I think fly catchers um, clue in on the vegetation and the combination of surface water and groundwater um, can help generate that vegetation. I will say though, there are situations where we've had lakes um, inundate the bottom of, of habitat and fly catchers seem to like that, to be over that water. And I think part of that is the insects that are attracted to that combination of water and vegetation. But those are pretty rare. So now I'm going to transition a little bit into tamarisk. Again, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I never thought in my life I'd spend 25 years on tamarisk. Um, but you know, as you guys probably know, um, you know, us here in wildlife biology, um, we like to think that we're all about the animals, and we are, but it's really all about the landscape that supports them. It's the habitat. That's really what wildlife management is, is, is their habitat. And subsequently, when I got involved in fly catchers, I got involved with tamarisk. And um, you can see here, this, this pie chart here, this addresses kind of the configuration of, of, of vegetation of species in um, flycatcher territories, where this uh, this reddish ch chunk on the right hand side um, that this is about this is habitat territories that were in about greater than ninety percent ninety percent native habitat. So that's forty four percent of all the flycatcher territories out there that had been recorded, and um, this was a, from a range wide estimate um, from about a decade ago. Um, so, you know, about half the territory is a little over 40 percent. It was all native, almost all native. But the other half was some combination of exotic and native, whether it was a little bit more exotic than native or a little bit more native than exotic. So about again, about half the territories had some important amount of tamarisk. And and the reason why flycatchers like tamarisk is that it has a lot of vegetation density and it has these vertical branches that you know i i always let, i always say it's kind of like uh, an upside down tripod and that upside down tripod is a great place to build your nest in okay um tamarisk retains that mid serial stage size and stays vegetated to the ground for a, a long period of time. Something like um, coyote willow, it's got a pretty short lifespan. Uh, Gooding's willow will, if it's, if it's not um, blown out by a flood, you know, it can grow into a mature tree, you know, and loses some of that density. But, um, Tamarisk stays in that bushy um, status for a pretty long period of time. And it's, it's, it's so flexible in where it can grow.
Um, here's another picture of flycatcher and combination and some tamarisk habitat. And when, you know, when we first listed the flycatcher in 95, um, if you ever read that listing rule, we, um, we alluded, even well, even suggested that, that flycatchers might be listed because of tamarisk. Um, we were wrong, <laughs> but in that listing rule, we, we said, you know, more studies needed to occur. And, and, and so they did. And one of the uh, nicest studies that was done was comparing birds um, in native, primarily native habitat to birds in primarily tamarisk habitat. And because the, the, the assertion had been made that, oh, they may use tamarisk, but they don't do well in it. It's not good habitat for them. And as we discovered, there was no difference in their breeding success, their survival, their physiological condition, or prey abundance. Um, in fact, when they compared the blood of the flycatchers using the tamarisk versus native habitat, when you looked at all the kind of factors in the blood, they 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 said the flycatchers were just a hair healthier in tamarisk compared to native habitat. Um, so this this goes to some of the misconceptions we'll shall talk about in a moment of of tamarisk in that it it was it's a wasteland for wildlife, and it it's not a wasteland for wildlife. And and um, there's another paper out there. I'm not I'm not sure if I if I included that that showed that about 50 riparian bird species nest in tamarisk. Um, the, 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 the two kind of groups of birds that aren't particularly fond of tamarisk, it kind of stands to reason, is are, are the hawks. And you can imagine it doesn't grow really high with strong branches. And uh, the uh, the woodpeckers, you know, it doesn't really kind of have that trunk structure that um the woodpeckers would want to would want to use but it it's used by a lot of different species so um you know why do we have a lot of tamarisk um you know tamarisk um has been in this in this country since the mid 1800s um so it's not new um but in, and initially if, if you go back to the history and i um tamarisk was lauded as an elegant beautiful plant that has lots of utility <laughs> and and then sometime uh, after the 1940s, um, it started being demonized as something that was stealing our water, was a wasteland for wildlife. Here, all that kind here. Of stuff. come here. Um, mm -hmm. And it really started to spread you know, Tamara started to spread as we started to change rivers in the Southwest in the early 1900s with the variety of, of, of damming and storage that, that started occurring in, at least in Arizona. And, you know, most of the central Arizona dams were built um, in the thirties. Um, and so, changing river flow, uh, ceasing flood flow, preventing aquifers from filling up and uh, raising groundwater, uh, dropping um, uh, lake levels in the summertime, um, uh, increasing river flow in the summertime, uh, ag return flow that goes back into the floodplain in the summertime, these were all things that helped that helped generate tamarisk and reduces the occurrence of native vegetation. You know, 
cottonwood and willow, they seed in the late winter and spring when flooding happens on these rivers. And when dams cease flooding, you don't get the generation of these plants. Um, when you increase flows for water delivery for agriculture in the summertime, you're putting water on the floodplain when tamarisk is seeding. When you, when you reduce lake elevations, these dynamic reservoirs like Alamo or Horseshoe or uh, San Carlos or Roosevelt, um, when you, these dynamic reservoirs, when you, they fill up during the winter and spring and they recede in the summer. And when that happens, again, you're exposing floodplains in the summertime when um, tamarisk is seeding. So all of these forces help to promote tamarisk and reduce native vegetation. We put, um, when we, uh, all the agriculture and areas that we have on some of these rivers, water is diverted. And then the egg return flow comes in onto the floodplains in the summertime, that stimulates tamarisk. Uh, areas where we've got levees, it separates water from the floodplain. Groundwater pumping, we've, we've got that in a lot of these valleys in Arizona. It reduces the elevation of groundwater beyond where native plants can grow. And it, it, it uh, allows uh, tamarisk to flourish. And then, um, uh, um, if we have some overgrazing in an area, cattle can target native plants and help um, tamarisk uh, um, be more abundant. So it's really the changes in these landscapes that has really helped um, native plants to diminish and tamarisk to flourish. And I, I use the word flourish on purpose. Um, I said, you know, Tamaris has been here since the 1850s, okay? I think it was 1850s. It's, 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 it's going to be on the landscape. But the places where it flourishes, like in these pictures, like in the Safford Valley or at Roosevelt Lake or the um, Lower Gila River, um, you know, these are the things where the, the uh, uh, landscape has been really changed. The rivers have been really altered. So you may have heard these things over the years. I heard them. You know, I, I mentioned I grew up in California. Um, I didn't know about Tamarisk in the Bay Area. And I was I was running around chaparrales and redwood forests. And uh, when I came out here, I didn't know about Tamarisk. But I heard people telling me it was bad. And I heard all of these things about Tamarisk. And then I started to do my research. And one of the things I heard was, it's horrible. It uses more water than native trees. It dries up streams. The research shows it doesn't. Um, I've heard that it causes soil to be more saline, preventing other plants from growing. It doesn't. Um, they've done analysis of areas where Tamarisk occurs on the San Pedro River, and it's no more saline than the areas next to it. What, what people are seeing is an area like below Hoover Dam, where flooding has ceased. Groundwater has, has distanced itself from the channel, and those salts in the soil start to get raised up towards the surface. And Tamarisk is like, I'm really adaptable. I can grow in this area. And tamarisk grows. They look at the soil. They say, oh, this tamarisk is there. The soil is more saline. The tamarisk, tamarisk caused it. And so it's it's, it's it, looking at the, a, the wrong thing on what generated more saline soil. It was that ceasing of, flo of, of floods that would wash salts away and elevate groundwater. Again, wasteland for wildlife. When, when I came here, what I was told is only doves used it. And then when they found flycatchers, it was only flycatchers and doves used it. And um, you guys might remember Troy Corman that did that Arizona breeding bird atlas work. Um, and if you go through there, um, you can see all the numerous uh, riparian bird species that, that uses um, um, tamarisk to nest. And... Um, 
one of the things people will also will, will say was that uh, the insect population is affected by tamarisk. And the the uh, the insects folks did some analysis about that. And they did find that the um, there was differences in the numbers of the different type of insects in native versus tam risk, but the same suite of species occurred. And you'll, one of the things you'll also hear is that if you cut down tam risk, it'll allow the native trees to return and grow. You know, the Garden of Eden will reappear. Again, that's a misconception. Um, people that are interested in improving habitat have been doing that for decades. It doesn't happen, it wastes money, um, and you just degrade habitat for a period of time. Um, you hear this uh, expression, tamarisk has outcompeted and displacing native trees. And I think that that plays into this perspective that if we reduce the competition, remove tamarisk, then the native plants will flourish. And this just you know misses the point that tamarisk is a symptom of the alterations that we've done to these streams. Um, and then um, the last one, which isn't a mis misconception, it's true. Tamarisk does increase the risk of fire. It's a flammable plant. Um, it's more flammable than cottonwoods and willows, but, but that, that risk of fire is usually a product uh, of drying these rivers and in, in making less wet areas and areas more prone to fire. So again, what I've kind of alluded to earlier is again, where tamarisk flourishes, and again, flourishes is the key word here. It's typically a symptom of landscape changes, mostly due to all the alterations in stream flow and groundwater that don't favor native plants. So this, the University of Arizona's Water Resources Department, which I thought was a, a great um, source for this information, they produced a newsletter a few years ago. And I thought, this is the water people, right? You know, for years, all I've heard is that Tamarisk uh, is sucking our, our streams dry and stealing water. And their water resources to, had these points that I want to emphasize. Uh, it's not the salt cedar is not the riparian threat people perceive it to be. At issue is the contribution of science to land and water management. U of A, ASU, and USGS and other agencies have studied the salt cedar for over 10 years. They argue that the environmental benefits outweigh arguments to eradicate the plant, and misguided opinions about the plant linger partly due to outdated science. Also, an emotional reaction predeposes people against salt cedar. And this last one, I find this all the time. Um, I'm always amazed at what I hear from my colleagues and they say, I hate tamarisk. And I just kind of go, really, man, it's, it's a plant. <laughs> you know, save your hate for something better like disco or something, you know, um, I, I just, it's, it's a plant. And, and, and it's the, the, our, our feelings about tamarisk. I mean, it's, it's gotten so bizarre. I think one of the papers I, um, I, I, I gave Carrie was a paper from ASU that explored our feelings about tamarisk. And that's what it's got to, um, is our, our perspectives about the plant. So I thought this was uh, uh, nicely done and um, wanted to share that. So um, there's a lot of folks um, in a variety of agencies that want to restore riparian habitat. And um, that word you get kind of maybe I'm, when I mentioned the word flourish um, here I'm using the word restoration. It's, it's an important word. Um, restoration, real restoration, is complex. 
challenging. Um, and when you hear that word, um, when I see it in a biological assessment from an agency, you know, I mean, uh, what's, what's more positive than we're gonna restore something, right? It's great, Who, who's gonna say no to restoring something? Ah, but the devil's in the details. And some of you people, some of you guys here, it looks like we might have some car guys here. I don't know. Um, I, I restored a 1966 Mustang. It took me 20 years. Um, but if all I did was put a coat of paint and some new upholstery in that thing, I would say the restoration is incomplete because the car needs to function. And I needed to address the engine and the transmission and the brakes. And without those things, it doesn't function like a car does. And when people talk about restoration, so often what they really are talking about is vegetation management, not restoration, because they're not dealing with the function of the system. And the function of the system, riparian plants, the primary determinant of, ri of riparian plant species is stream flow. And that is a different beast and is hard to restore, much easier said than done. And so because it's so hard to deal with, people target the vegetation and that just does not help the function. And especially, again, in areas where tamarisk flourishes. So, you know, as we kind of alluded to earlier, a lot of southwestern rivers are altered by damming and groundwater pumping. You, you all live in Arizona. You know about Hoover Dam, Glen Canyon Dam, Horseshoe Dam, Bartlett Dam, uh, uh, Stewart Mountain Dam, uh, Horse Mesa Dam, um, uh, Roosevelt Dam, Coolidge Dam, um, and there are other ones, smaller ones out there, Parker Dam. Uh, Tamarisk is better adapted to changes. Um, you know, all those dams, you, the reason why we're here is largely because those dams are there. Um, water management in most of these areas is probably not likely going to change. Um, there are some areas where it has, not so much in Arizona, in some other um, areas of the country. Um, you might be familiar with, with uh, Fossil Creek. And there was one area where we actually had some changes uh, to a dam, which is great. Um, um, so when we talk about water and damming, you know, measures to counter these existing landscape, landscape conditions are costly. Um, they may persist indefinitely or at least as long as we're around. Um, if you're doing these sort of plant vegetation management areas in unregulated rivers, but maybe they're areas that are uh, uh, groundwater, have heavy groundwater pumping, like the Safford Valley. Um, you might take out tamarisk, um, put in um, uh, some plantings, and your groundwater elevation isn't there. Maybe some of them uh, take, and then you've got a flood, tears them out, and what have you done? Um, you've put all those plantings in there and they're gone. Um, clearly groundwater elevation and soils are critical. Um, when we think about trying to improve rivers and what we can do, um, maybe a, a mixture of native and exotic may be the best hope that we have. Um, eliminating tamarisk is really unreasonable. Um, and that's what a lot of people are striving to do but I can't eliminate the weeds in my backyard. How can we really reasonably expect to eliminate this plant that occurs across numerous states that's been around for uh, 170 years that is so ubiquitous? Um, it's, it's probably not reasonable. Um, since I've been around, few very active restoration projects 
have resulted in actually creating nesting flycatcher habitat. There's been a handful and altering water was really the key into um, creating flycatcher habitat. Uh, I just came across this article just the other day. It was from 2017, and I had not seen it before. Um, and it looked at over 400 sites across the Southwest, and it was evaluating biocontrol, fire, um, uh, hand removal, and mechanical re removal of tamarisk. And when they looked at all these projects, um, they said that some native vegetation improved, but it was very small. And they uh, determined that in the Southwest, managers have focused too much on weed control um, and they've overlooked the restoration of fluvial processes that provide floodplain vegetation. And there we go restoration of fluvial processes. That's what so often these kind of projects um, miss. And I have these three pictures here and they aren't from the same spot, but they kind of show what some of this mechanical removal kind of look like from um, the beginning to the middle to the end. And you can get these, you know, bulldozers that go out and take down this tamarisk and people can go plant these trees and they just don't survive. And what's going to happen is tamarisk will eventually return. So with all of that, an understanding that rivers really dictate our plants, the plant species, um, I'm going to be a little bit facetious here. Who thought it was a great idea to introduce a beetle from um, China, Crete, Uzbekistan, and Tunisia that would diminish the amount of tamarisk out there? Well, our government um, concluded that we could bring these beetles over and based upon the latitude they were recovered and what they knew about them, that we could release these beetles outside the range of the flycatcher and they would only move tens of feet per year. And even if they did get below the 38th uh, um, parallel, which is right about the Northern boundary of the flycatcher, they wouldn't survive. Um, we're going to release them 200 miles away from the flycatcher, um, and they won't survive. And as it turned out, of course, they were wrong. Beetles moved miles and miles per year. They were able to um, uh, move uh, into the flycatcher's range. Um, and now, uh, since beetles were rele released in the early aughts, um, we've got leaf beetles throughout the um, southwestern U.S., um, this map here is showing, you know, these four corner states primarily and older detections and more recent detections of leaf beetles. And, you know, in Arizona, they initially came down uh, the Virgin River into the Colorado River. That's how they kind of leaked into the, and spread throughout the Colorado and the, and the Little Colorado River um, and traveled all the way down to Mexico. And then they started getting found on the Upper Verde River, the Haciampa, and now they're climbing up the Gila River east towards central Arizona from the Colorado River. Um, we had beetles from uh, the north come down the Rio Grande here. Um, uh, Aphis released beetles down in Texas here. Uh, different, a different species, they came up north that other species has come across uh, west now. And uh, we've got beetles now coming up the Gila River that is as far as it's probably got, they've got past the San Pedro. Um, so just in the last couple years, we have beetles that have uh, hit these, these, these really um, large 
centers of fly catchers in Arizona at the Roosevelt area, the Gila River area, the San Pedro Gila confluence, these spots here. And these areas have a lot of tamarisk in their territories. Um, we'll, we'll see it probably in a number of years what happens. Um, but what, what the beetles will do is, I put a picture of that. Yes. What the beetles will do is that they'll, they'll defoliate tamarisk um, for a number of years. And eventually um, the plants will perish. And probably the weakest plants will perish and probably not all the plants will perish. It'll, it'll vary depending on the health of the tamarisk, but you can get, um, you know, I think the estimate is about five years and some good proportion of tamarisk will, 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 um, will perish. And here you can see some before and after pictures within a relatively short period of time, within a month, uh, um, how, uh, how different it can look, the kind of, effect the beetles that can have. And this can happen more than one time during a year, these multiple defoliations. Um, and it can happen, you can, you can imagine in this picture here, flycatcher returns from Costa Rica, sets, sets up his territory, builds a nest, is all ready to go. And then what this picture is above, that's what happens, right? And we've seen that happen where uh, it loses all it, the cover, its thermal protection, its protection from predators and brood parasites, brood parasite, paras, parasites, and um, we lose uh, um, nesting attempts. But we've been fortunate in some years that the um, birds have been able to get off a clutch before this defoliation occurs. So, um, but the, the beetles and the timing of this defoliation, um, it's unpredictable, but sometimes we can get lucky. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this all in the context of flycatchers, but it's not just flycatchers. You know, I mentioned these, a lot of other birds are using this habitat. Um, and there's other tangential effects of defoliating these plants. Um, we may increase sedimentation. It's, I mentioned it's already a fire risk. Um, adding all that leaf litter certainly doesn't help. Uh, what we've also seen in these areas have had beetles for a while and we've lost tamarisk is, you know, as I mentioned before, we're not getting the Garden of Eden reappearing. We're getting uh, these influx of exotic weeds like kochia and knapweed, uh, something with even less wildlife value. But some interesting things are happening. These different beetles are meeting up out there on the landscape, and there's some indication that these beetles are hybridizing, and what they're creating may be like uh, a beetle version of a mule you know, where it's infertile. So that's gonna warrant some, some more study. Um, we've also seen instances where beetles have showed up, they've defoliated, plants have started to perish, and then beetles go away. So the question is, are they gonna come back? And when are they gonna come back? <laughs> And so, you know, this is, this is the only thing that time is gonna give us is to learn a little bit more about what this new, uh, for lack of a better term, new disturbance factor is going to have on habitat, plant species that are out there and the animal's response to it. You know, we already have fire, and flooding, um, as disturbance factors. And um, I guess, you know, we've got a new one. Um, and, you know, I talk about all those misconceptions out there and, um, you know, uh, our, our, our intrepid reporters often don't help inform the public as best as they can. 
And I've read articles coming out of the Las Vegas Sun um, that have described things like beetles can save our water and native vegetation will spread and flourish as tamarisk declines. And I've read it, this kind of stuff in Scientific American. Um, it, I've read it in a variety, I've seen it on news, um, art, uh, news, uh, uh, news programs, and it's really frustrating. Um, that there is this confusion out there. And of course, you know, when you you see all these different things, you know, if, if you're looking for it, you know, if you're reading things uh, in newspapers, if you're seeing news segments, if you're seeing somebody like me gab about something, you're seeing a, a journal article and you've got all this information for, uh, saying all this different stuff, um, no wonder people are confused. And, and, uh, you know, I, I take it, I, you know, to me, this is, this is our story. This is wildlife biologists and land manage land manage land managers story. And, um, we got it wrong a long time ago and it's, it's time to try and get it right. But, uh, we've got an uphill climb with a lot of the, um, belief that's, that's out there. So, um, I, okay, I see I've gone about 15 minutes over, but here's, I'm at the end now. Thanks for being patient with me. And so here's some kind of summary um, pieces of, of information here. Um, the good news is through surveys and management, flycatchers are more abundant and widespread since listing. You know, uh, proposed for listing, we were at, just, we know, knowing of, we knew of just over hundred territories, uh, when we listed it, I think we it was around 300. Um, and now the latest estimate is over 1,600 pairs of flycatchers. Good news. Um, challenging news is that they're heavily weighted to five areas. Um, you know, all your, you don't want all your flycatchers in one basket kind of thing. It makes them more susceptible um, to catastrophic events. So the real goal for flycatcher recovery is not having a lot of flycatchers in one spot. It's having them more evenly distributed across the range. We've got a long, uh, long ways to go. Tamaris can be good flycatcher nesting habitat. It's not the threat once believed. It really was a serendipitous benefit. Nobody planned this, um, but it proved to be an important plant and able to flourish where native plants couldn't with all the ongoing um, river alterations that are occurring, damming, water storage, groundwater depletion. Um, all of that river management, really that again, makes it so I can sit here in Phoenix and talk about this um, and everybody else that what six, seven, eight million people here and elsewhere it's, it's a big obstacle to improving flycatcher habitat. Um, there's a lot of controversy, misinformation, and misunderstanding that surrounds perspectives on why tamarisk occurs, native habitat doesn't, and that includes the ways to improve riparian habitat. So I always, when I give this kind of talk, I always encourage people to seek out the science. And um, I've tried to help you guys by by providing some of that material. Um, the Congress commissioned USGS to do a literature review a number of years ago. And that was one of the links, uh, Carrie, that I provided because it was too big to send. And it, to me, is it's the best um, treatment on Tamarisk and also Russian olive that's out there. And of course, uh, we have this leaf beetle. Um, it's, it's a new threat. And it just came to Arizona where the flycatchers are in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, my crystal ball's a little murky, but I don't think it's going to be good. Um, the question is going to be how bad. And we'll, time will tell. And well, that is all I've got for you. So I'm going to stop sharing and we can go back to our wonderful smiling faces. All right. Well, thank you so much for a really interesting presentation and really challenging 
in terms of some of the ideas that we've held in uh, advocating for uh, riparian restoration. Um, I would like to ask the group if you are willing, and Greg, if you are willing, if we could take some questions. Sure. Okay, have at it, folks. See, Edwina, Edwina had a hand up, I think. Or maybe it was just a thumbs up, not a question. <laughs> I think it was a thumbs up. Any questions? Actually, I did want to um, just say, um, do you think in the agency that there's more um, an attitude now about the Tamarisk? Is that that it's changing? or Because I kind of heard that you're kind of a lone voice. So what's your... Have you, have you heard that? <laughs> anyway. Um, you know... Um... So, you know, I mentioned some of that um, uh, that that newsletter from U of A, and that was from 2008, 2009, 2010, I think. And um, I think agencies like Reclamation have come to that realization when they were developing their... Um, uh, habitat conservation plan for the lower Colorado River. Um, you know, reclamation has been involved in trying to improve riparian habitat along the Colorado River, lower Colorado River for decades. And failure after failure after failure after failure. And they realized that, you know, the conditions out there were not suitable for native riparian habitat. In order to um, establish some sort of native riparian habitat. Um, they look to ag fields adjacent to the riparian area, which used to be part of the floodplain before damming, where uh, they had um, water rights and the soils weren't um, highly saline in order to try and farm riparian habitat for cuckoos and flycatchers and other species. Um, so they understood the the um, the, the challenge of, of trying to establish native riparian habitat along these altered river courses. Um, I may be a lone voice, but I'd say that the science supports me. And um, that article I mentioned, looking at over 400 sites, it says that people um, have been putting too much attention into plant management and put, need to put more into river management. Um, um, so if if people aren't paying attention, then I all I can say is I don't think they're paying attention to the science, <laughs> and I encourage them to read more. In in relation to that, I'd like to get your reaction. About two years or so ago now, I went to. Um, a conference uh, sponsored by Rivers Edge West. And yep. the way they were looking at things at that conference was the Tamarisk era is over, which may be an overstatement of what they believe, but basically that with the leaf beetles, that there was going to be a lot less Tamarisk and that the uh, what part of what we looked at at the conference was where to go from there. What's what's the effect going to be on the habitat? And as you say, it's very likely in many cases not going to be cottonwood and willow and mesquite. No, no. We're, I think you know we're we're still going to be learning. You have to remember, and here's part of my bias here. Okay, Rivers Edge West used to be called the Tamaris Coalition, <laughs> of which. It's part of my, my dumb jokes, my focus on words. I don't know why they were called that. I think they should have been called the anti tamarisk Coalition. But um, they changed their name, and they, um, they were some of the – they were a group that was promoting a, a bunch of these misconceptions in the past, and they've grown – through time, um, partly in changing their name 
And they've starting to be more aware of the science behind what's occurring out there. And, and so I, I think they've improved. Um, but I think what we're learning is that Tamrisk is not going away. It's just changing. And we're not going to get the Garden of Eden. And we're going to get something else that we might not like as much as Tamarisk. Um, the fire risk is going to be there. And um, there may be some spots out there, you know, where you, we get some reduced Tamarisk without much of an issue. You know, the Upper Verde River, you know, I don't know what the proportion of Tamarisk is up there. Maybe overall... 20, 25 percent. I don't know. But, you know, we get the flows are are, are, are still uh, unaffected. I mean, we have diversions, groundwater pumping, but um, the conditions are primarily there to generate native habitat. So if the beetle affected tamarisk in that portion of river, I don't think there'd be much of a difference, you know, and we would probably see a, some improved native habitat. Same thing with portions of the lower San Pedro, you know, in areas where the conditions are pretty good, you know, and Tamarisk is, is a small portion out there, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to work out okay. It's these areas like the Colorado River and the Gila River where, boy, it's, it's just, it's really, really altered. And you're not going to get back what you want. And in overall, it's probably going to be worse. We're going to see a variety of responses, you know, to the beetle, depending on the conditions of the streams in those areas. It's not going to be the same across the range. At least that's, that's what my crystal ball and some of the literature already says. So Greg, Other the Trace Rios area of... Um you know, the Gila yeah. salt and the, what is it, the Santa Cruz come up? Haciamba. That, Haciamba. Yeah. Um, that has that has a whole lot of tamarisk in it. And I think Beetles there it, too. Game and Fish has a big project to um, remove a lot of the tamarisk and replant. Um, yeah. The core, the core did a lot of work years ago of, of removing tamarisk. And the game and fish may continue that. Um, that's a tough area to restore um, because of Coolidge Dam up, upstream and the other and the other uh, um, diversions. Um, the, the kind of water that area gets is uh, wastewater from the wastewater treatment plant there. Um, that's what creates that standing water in that area primarily. And then you'll get your periodic um, inflow from the Haciampa when there's storms. You get a little bit of ag return flow. And then in the wintertime, um, because the storage on the Verde River is lower, you'll get some Verde River flow that, that comes down to the salt and hits Trace Rios. So those are kind of the sources of, of surface water in there, but you're never gonna get that regular flood flow through that area that really um, generates a lot of native habitat. You know, I think the last time we had a whopper was uh, 1993. You know, I don't know if, if, if any of you are around 93 and 95, we had these huge storms that um, just rearranged all the vegetation out there um, through central Arizona. And that was the last time the Coolidge um, let a lot of water down that came down the Gila. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the equations for native habitat and the processes, you know, it's not rocket science. Um, these plants grow in shallow groundwater. They, 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 they just, they just can't grow where you have groundwater far below the surface. It's just, those are just the facts. And these plants are meant to recycle through time. You know, they're meant to grow and build up and recycle and grow and build up and recycle. 
flooding is important to rivers and riparian habitat, just like fire is important to forests. And we screwed that up. <laughs> and we screwed up flood, re flood regimes in all these rivers too. Yep. Well, you know, you were talking about um, positive uh, characteristics of tamarisk yeah. and uh, i was on a vacation in italy near la spezia which is where the italian navy is headquartered uh and uh, on the beach uh there was a walk and in little not little but like 10 gallon planters they had tamarisk and yeah. and it, it was you know Pentandra, chinensis, whatever you want to call it, not athol. Yeah, right. You and know they they love it. Yeah. Um, some some of you may remember um, somebody was mentioning Jim Rohrbar in our office. You might somebody might, might remember Tom Gatz, who uh worked in this office for a lot mm -hmm. of years and reclamation before that and works at at the uh um uh at the arboretum down by the zoo. Um he had a picture. Of uh, of tamarisk being sold in nurseries here in town, you know, from a decade ago. Yeah. So same thing. Yeah. Sometimes people think it's heather, <laughs> heather yeah. trees. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, it, again, reading some of this research, uh, talking about the history, and I, I'm not sure if that's one of the ones. Uh, Matthew Chu from ASU mm -hmm. has an article called "The Biological Monstering of Tamarisk." And he yeah. kind of goes back into the history and talks about um, what people thought about it and what how what was written about it and how it was used in the in the eighteen hundreds and um, in early nineteen hundreds. Okay. Any more questions? Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for attending tonight, and in particular, Greg, uh, your presentation and. Um, I've got to do some revising and reading and thinking about all this. It's, it really is challenging in terms of the type of comments that we would make on, for example, a Tamaris clearing project as they've been carrying out around Buckeye. And oh, boy, yeah. Yeah. There's a city, city, uh, mayor or somebody out there that's really got it out for tamarisk yeah um, well you know they're claiming it causes flooding and uh that that's their reason they want to do it but at a at a hearing on uh oh that was done by the state legislature maybe four years ago um rusty bowers and gail griffin um you know i said well if you're going to clear it at least plant cottonwood and willow but it looks like that might not be the best prescription and indeed people have told me a number of people who have a scientific background that the only way you're going to sustain the cottonwood and willow along the Col lower colorado river is by continually uh farming it in effect yeah you know back in this i think it was back in the 70s they actually cleared tamarisk, you know, a thousand foot wide swath through the Gila River down, you know, this past down, you know, through town here, which through that Buckeye area, you know. Oh, and guess what? It grew back. Yeah. <laughs> it grew back. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, my perspective is that the, the reason why, uh, Tamarisk is targeted in that area um, is because when the floods do come, like they did in 1993 and 1995, um, having any kind of plant out there, I mean, that that's, you know what, a, the plant, a riparian plant's purpose is to stop, slow down, and spread out water okay that's what its purpose is and that's what's great about it you know because when it does that it deposits sediment and it fills up aquifers but what it also does is it moves water into areas 
where people want to build houses and it causes flood insurance um, to be higher because the, the floodplain width is much bigger um, when you have vegetation in areas. So when the Corps of Engineers is interested in some sort of improvement, they would rather have something like cattails that lay down when there's floods than some sort of woody vegetation that stops water and causes it to spread out, whether it's tamarisk or cottonwood or willow. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I'm retiring in five months. <laughs> so uh, maybe we should have you back uh, in a little uh, after five months and uh, uh, you might say some things that you might not want to say now. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, and to me, those things are just river function 101. Yeah. You know, that's, 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 those things aren't mysteries. That's river function 101. Right. And one of the things that we're trying to advocate for uh, in Sierra Club, we have a Colorado River Task Force uh, in the water management EISs that have come out. Of course, now the post-2026 is the one we're looking at coming out in draft form in December, is we are advocating to, just as they've done in the Grand Canyon, although not <laughs> the greatest job, to consider the needs of the river and the flows that you've spoken about in relation to the um, the ecosystem, which now I think I have broadened to include tamarisk uh, as a consideration. So, um, you know, yeah. like you say, it's difficult, but we're trying. Right. And, and, and you know, so... <laughs> I forget who said I might be like a lone wolf um, or a lone voice rather. Um, 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 I'm not as lonely as I once was. <laughs> and, and, and I, I don't want to uh, suggest that uh, um, we shouldn't strive for something good and something better. And, you know, we should. Um, what, what I want to convey is that there are, people with a lot of greater expectations than what the landscape can support and that we ought to recalibrate what we can what can actually occur with the landscape that's in the condition that it's that it's in mm -hmm. you know and you know in the face of the lack of this function that we don't have um what can we actually attain and maintain and develop and so much of what what and what do we have the will <laughs> and the money to continue to address through time um you know i made this comment that you know people that want to eradicate tamarisk and i said i can't get the weeds out of my out of my house in my backyard um and and i i i think that's Somebody needs to really think about there. This is not a one time set it and forget it sort of issue. This is, you know, these sort of altered environments where the function is gone, it's going to have to have some constant attention to have the kind of landscape that people are thinking that there's going to occur and they're going to want there. So. Mm -hmm you know, measured expectations of what really can happen. Right. Well, any last questions? All right. Well, Greg, I want to thank you again. Uh, it's, it's been a great presentation, well worth the time. I hope the rest of you feel the same thing. And uh, we wish you uh, uh, happiness and retirement, whether you continue <laughs> with tamarisk and and oh. fly catchers or restoring cars <laughs> that's better all right all right hey, well thanks everybody thanks for inviting me thanks for being patient thanks for the good questions thanks for sticking with me for more time than than i was supposed to do this in so thank you so much all right thank you all right thanks so to all of you we'll be back in a month and we'll hear about native fish cool thank you, you folks thank See you, you Greg. Later. Thank you.
Good night. Good night. Good night.